so well it would be unfair if you have a conference on failure scale and we don't talk about microservices you know i've been sitting here wondering why is no one talking about it anyway so we'll talk about it so this is about i'm going to talk about uh, microservice architectures design patterns that you consider while building a system using microservices and how a framework that we call gilmer is going to help you do all of that first of all who am i uh, my i'm piyush verma uh, sadly i'm not walter the my twitter handles me is on 10 you can write drop me an email and in case you do want to know more about my website you can check that out as well so let's start with uh, how many of you involve in microservices or intend to do microservices in your architectures okay that's fairly a lot of people here uh it would make a good uh, talk then so what exactly are services this would be a quick recap for the rest of you who didn't raise your hand actually first of all let me see who how many people can raise their hand like in general oh cool so everyone can raise their hand here now i just wanted to make sure the maths do right so what are services uh services are logical entities that run separately from code units so think of them like processes in your operating system space the idea is that they don't interfere with each other each one of them being absolutely uh narrowed down to the lowest possible thing so i was having a word with uh, anand yesterday and he gave me a very good definition of this he said so we as software engineers you know keep we don't have an end to our software we keep writing software and we realize okay it doesn't end but the whole microservice paradigm has actually changed that we are going the other way around how much can we trim it down where it does nothing beyond a few bunch of lines and that's where we call it an end so that's what a service would be so as i said they're independent of each other they can be comprised of one or more services like uh there could be a service which does addition multiplication subtraction or could be a one which does all of them put together and calls the other services invariably services span across multiple servers for load and tolerance i um, mean this is the part that we have been talking most about at this conference on how do you handle multiple servers and the services comprise of many servers put together so you could have like tens and hundreds of notification servers and one service which is responsible for all of that put together then services help you scale and are flexible what do i mean by that uh primarily is i mean because it spans across service it becomes scalable but also the fact that you can do it in multiple languages the same service could be written in go there could be another service which is being written in java there's another one which is written in ruby and all of them comprised make one system of yours and that allows a service oriented architecture really easy to adapt to and really lucrative as well this is something that i found on internet and i've stuck with it like this is like an amazing definition of why we need services uh everyone fails i mean we have talked about it repeatedly in the past 36 hours and but as from the management perspective we need to know who do we blame it on uh might sound funny i mean the managers are not the bad people because on why it comes into the picture i'll explain is uh so let me actually do this the other way around let me tell you what the management problem is uh so let's say you have a payment service now usually how we design our systems is we have a monolith which comprises of uh, a bunch of interactions happening and we usually get by saying that we are a small team and we cannot really afford to have uh multiple distributed servers and we're going to make it in one single thing so there are three people who are actually contributing to the same service let's call it a payment service it's 1 am in the night and something crashes i bet you it will crash it's one day or the other who do you call which one of the three people is responsible for it now to avoid conflicts like this is where i say microservice architecture has a lot of business value uh this comes from netflix school of thought as well which is you few own one component of the system you are entirely responsible for scaling it out for deploying it for maintaining uptime and for troubleshooting and fixing if there is something that you cannot do 
you might as well offload it as another service to another someone who will be responsible. If your service is not spitting out errors when it should, it's your problem. This accountability is something for which I personally prefer microservice architecture above all the other things. I mean, infrastructure problems can be taken care of. Uh, I mean, of course, they cannot be at the scale of large companies like Facebook, Google, etc. But to, for the most of us, we can do tackle it. I mean, there are dozens of in tools and frameworks out there which help us do it. But this is one single problem where we'll all fail every time. And then the software problem is scalability. I'll cover this part uh, later when, through my talk on what exactly by what I mean when I say scalable architectures. Now, just like any other uh, computer science problem or any other thing, we have design patterns to any microservice architecture. Uh, so how do we identify them? Let's go through one by one. One of the foremost important design patterns is a request response architecture. This is what we traditionally have known as what we do with HTTP. Uh, a lot of people who use, how many of you have used GoKit or used gRPC in some form or the other in production? Okay, that's some, some digital ocean guys. Okay, a fair few other hands. So these are so request response is primarily where you actually, I mean, as the name suggests, you request something and you would get a response. Let's see what a sample would look like. I have a caller and I have a service. I send hello and I get aloha. That's a response back. Or I could get a wrong number. Whatever be the case, I'm always assured that there will be a response. Be it a good data or be it a bad data. Now comes a, a tricky topic here. How do you differentiate a failure? When you get a response over here, at first I got aloha, then I got wrong number. How do I differentiate what is good and what is bad? So usually the essence is that every response comes along with the code. This is what SCTP status codes is also known for. So if you get anything which is 200, it's good. If anything that is greater than 400 or equal to 400 is an error condition. Now, this is important because we don't have to really parse the output every time and see if it's really a JSON, really a hash or an array or a string or something. Now, if you're using Gilmer, now this is the time when I actually start using some code samples. Most of these are written in Go, but the framework is pretty much available across Ruby and Java as well. So I'll just, I mean, most of this is just pseudo code sort of, a Go makes that easy. So every data transport that happens using Gilmer always has a sender ID. The importance of sender ID is I'll touch later, but just to uniquely identify every single message that is being sent out. And also it returns a code. The code, if it's greater than 400, eh, we know it's an error. Otherwise, 200 is code. And then there's a sender. The, the data is any interface that you intend to send back from the service. Uh, a typical request response structure done using Gilmer would look like this. I create a new message and I attach a new data to it. I create a request and then I send it. When I do g dot request, so over the course of the stock, every time I say small g, that would mean a Gilmer instance and a capital G would mean the namespace or a class, whichever we want to say it. So when I do a g dot request, the first argument to that is echo. Echo is a topic. So all communication exchanges, unlike HTTP based transports will do over topic exchanges. So this is one thing which is inherently different from conventionally when we say microservice architecture, we always say that there is some URL or an endpoint that we're going to hit. There'll be some IP address and there'll be a path pattern to it. Uh, with Gilmer, we all do it. We do it over purely non HTTP transport. And that is where Redis comes into the picture. We use Redis underneath. Uh, you can have your own choice of backend as well. That's really pluggable. Uh, so yeah, the, the choice becomes of a topic. So echo is a topic where you send your data and you get a response back. Now on the other hand, on the server side, or since there is no server on the service handler side, there's a new handler that you create and you say, I'll reply to echo with this function is then the function basically just sends a data and says pong. Uh, I'll do a demo of this later. So you can just, uh, just quickly go through this code. The one of the most important patterns apart from this is asynchronous or signal slots. Uh, how many of you have used Qt, uh, one of the core KD libraries that used to be around? I mean, it's still around, but was fairly popular. 
uh, okay how many of you use javascript okay good so every time you should see the event pattern which is running in your browser is pretty much running on the same concept so there are signals and there are slots a slot is a receiver for a message so if, if someone who has to get something done emits a signal and says and has almost no control over whether a slot would be received or not uh, sounds like there's a loss of uh, there could be a potential loss of data here but this is pretty much one of the most flexible and scalable architectures uh, I'll explain now so let's say we design a sample shopping cart example uh, so and the Gilmer is an engineer the web could be anything which is a web client or it could be another service calling another service uh, for the sake of convenience I'm assuming that this is uh, this is somewhere hidden at your back end where after a purchase was made you are supposed to send out notifications so an item was purchased and now you're supposed to notify the user based on there's an SMS notification to be sent out and there's an email notification to be sent out and suddenly a few months weeks later your management realizes that oh we're gonna make this app mobile only and now you have to add a push message server to it as well uh, why would you do that I don't know that's a business decision now each one of these service the services that you're bringing up now will listen on a topic item dot buy and item dot buy is now there's a star next to it this star is pretty important because every time we are talking about UDP like systems there is a notion of broadcast and that translates as wildcard topics in subscriber publisher patterns the so each one of these no services that you have actually is listening to item dot buy dot star so if you purchase an item which is item dot buy dot 500 all of these would get it because they are subscribing to a star pattern now let's say there is an online carnival going on and now you have to attach a new service uh, this service is responsible for payback points or a free delivery or a free good or anything something which is really unique to a particular set of items so you attach a new service which is VIP item purchase and this one only works on item dot buy dot 420 now the next item that is purchased if it was again item dot buy dot 500 since the topic does not match this service is not going to handle it whereas the rest of the three services that are currently running out there will continue to work now uh, let's say you have too much of traffic going out on the push notification service this push message server you have to scale up so you keep adding more and more servers out there and since all of them continue to listen to item.buy.star every time you buy an item the message would be relayed across to that service however this will raise a challenge here uh, if you notice this would result in if I had three servers there this would probably result in three messages being sent out so I still have to trap that so how do I do it so we include we introduce this concept called exclusion groups uh, how many of you use Kafka here or have you so you must be aware of what groups are so the promise here is that in this group if I tag it by saying a group push message only one of them is going to receive this message so even if I scale it to say 100 nodes only one of them is going to process that message this is an example of how you can achieve function point scaling through asynchronous patterns so despite me and now if I was to scale a SMS notifier I would do that as well by just adding another server there sorry this is a typical example of an asynchronous pattern that you will implement using Gilmer the signal part is fairly easy if you look at it it says g dot signal you specify the topic that you're sending it to you construct a new message a set data which is a string on the receiver side you have a g dot slot which says I'm a slot for this log example dot log and there's a handler next to it now if you notice carefully there is no response here because since there could be a broadcast happening as well there could be so many of the servers who are processing the same message a response doesn't make sense 
So if you have to think signal slots, think UDP on how you would design a system like that. The question now that arises is what do you, which pattern do you use in your application more? Would you prefer using a signal slot or would you prefer using a request response pattern? The answer lies in, I mean, as a usual answer is that it entirely depends on your application use case. But let's start with the request response. Where would you use it? You would use it where you want a confirmed delivery, where you are sending a message and now you want a response for it. The response could either be an error or the data, which is a valid return, but there has to be something. A request response pattern is something which is purely HTTP-like. So traditionally, whatever you've been thinking of a server architecture where you call a URL and you get a data is what you would use. And also, the delegation and the responsibility of the error is what defines it the best here. If your caller is responsible for carrying out an action based on an error condition, uh, which could be you tried to make a payment and the payment failed, now what happens next? Is this something which is which the caller is supposed to retry or call another alternate. Now the responsibility is for the caller, you would use a request response. Where would you use signal slots? Well, it's absolutely UDP-like if you think about it. Uh, it supports broadcasting. So if you have multiple receivers for the same message and you want to send it out, a fan out operation is something that you would use signal slots. Wildcard topics, when you want, want utmost scalability where you really think that uh, there's a there's a caveat to it that because there is no response being sent from signal slots, you can never really guarantee whether the message was lost over transit or the server just died or something happened. So if you believe that at an infrastructure level you can really do a good job of maintaining servers which are constantly alive, you would use a signal slot. Uh, Unreliable delivery, when you're okay with this fact that there could be someone who is not receiving this data, you would use it. And the receiver is responsible for error. Let's say I'm relaying the error, but the service who's sending it does not really care about what, like, uh, let's take an example of log forwarding. So from the application servers, you're actually emitting out logs. What you're using there is mostly UDP. So you use, how many of you use RSS log D or services like paper trail? Okay, that's a, a, you guys, rest of you, you should use something. Logs are important. But if you're using your, your UDP, your application doesn't care whether your log reads to the eventual destination or not. All it does is it just keeps spitting out log messages. There is a receiver at the other end which decides now what to do in case the, the log was not sent. Do I buffer it? Do I retry the file? All that is a responsibility there and hence you would use a signal slot. One of the biggest, another challenge that these days is pretty hot topic, I would say, with all these, uh, uh, any of the HashiCorp guys out here? There was one yesterday. So there's a tool by them called Console. And then do you have Zookeeper. How many of you use Zookeeper somewhere? All right, Route 53 for load balancing and uh, discovery. All right, great. So service discovery and load balancing is, is a great topic to talk about. Uh, so let's see how service discovery actually works. So let's say you have a notification server and now you have a load balancer on top of it. The first step is be that you have to tell the service discovery that hey, I'm around. Now this could happen using anything. I mean, uh, anyone ever use Fire DNS here? Uh, a decade old DNS tool? All right, so uh, it's pretty much your in-house Route 53 replacement. So you would either register your server and say that, hey, I'm around and I'm supposed to do this, this is my responsibility, this is my path, or well, you could use something like console which effectively does the same thing internally. Now, beyond this point, there'll be a constant exchange between the load balancer and the notification server. It will keep saying, are you healthy, are you alive? Now, the replicated load balancer itself is something that you have to scale up and you have to maintain the uptime of it. So this is any uh, of the ops guys out here, you would know that, I mean, there are, although there are tools to actually handle this, but this is separate infrastructure that you have to maintain for yourself. Now, if I add another notification server to this, I would run through the pretty much the same process, which would always be listened to. And in case notification server two died and I have to bring notification server three, I'll run through the same process again. 
and now I have a caller service which can exchange data with the load balancer, but oh wait, how do I get the IP address? I still have to pass that on or hard code it in the application. And that address could change in case it's replicated load balancer. Now how would you use this using Gilmer? This we realize that is actually one of the biggest pain points for not writing that big an architecture. Like if you're not running at a scale which really requires that many uh, discovery problems, why do it? Uh, so in Gilmer, since everything is a topic exchange, let's redo the same problem. There's a notification server which comes through a topic which is a manager dot notification. You can call this anything that you want to. Now I can have more of such manager dot notifications. And if I have a now a caller service which wants to send data to a manager dot notification, could be any of the patterns, could be a request response, could be a signal slot, either doesn't matter here. It still has to be routed to all of the servers. So this message would be sent to all of them. Now this is important part because when I introduce groups back then, uh, I'll explain how this actually works. Now the message would be sent to each of the servers out there. And once it is sent, the next step that they do is they try to acquire a lock. It's a distributed lock here. And each of the service now would want that lock. The lock identifier is the group that we defined. So the previous one, it was push message lock uh, service. That's the lock identification. But the lock shall only be provided to one of the services here. So your server, notification server one, acquires that lock and processes that message for you. This guarantees that now you're not going to process this message over and over again for three times over where it should only be done once. So what happened here, if you realize, there was no service discovery because there were topics. So when you were sending the data, you actually didn't care who you are sending it to. There's just a function call or a path that you care about. You don't care about which server is going to process it because you don't need to know that. There is no querying of the discovery process. Effectively, what you're saying is that I'm going to call a service and I'm not going to call an individual server because, so this is like, you know, if you have a wallet, if I ask you, do you have money in it? And do you have 500 bucks? The answer would be yes or no. You don't particularly care about whether I have that particular note in there or not of a, of a number. It's only a denomination that you care about. So servers are volatile. I mean, they are here today and not there tomorrow. They're going to crash. They're going to be replaced. And the service is something that you utmost care about. You don't care about whether your payment server is service is able to run 100 servers. You care whether your payment service can handle payments or not. No load balancing either. As long as there is capacity, you will serve it. If a message has been delivered to one and all, the fittest node, whosoever acquires the lock first, well, it's Darwin here. You don't really have to fight it. Uh, whosoever takes the lock, processes it, you don't care. Now, another thing important about uh, most of our distributed systems is errors. Errors happen all the time. You must have an ability to detect when an error has happened and what to do with it. You can't really just ignore them. So Gilmer provides you on a framework level multiple ways of handling these errors. The most important error that you care about is actually a timeout. A server side timeout or a client side timeout. A server side timeout is whenever you register a, a slot or a, a request handler, you say that I'm only going to serve this request for say 10 minutes. Imagine if it's a video encoding going on. You want to do it for a certain amount of time, but if it fails, you don't want to waste any further resources. A client side timeout is imagine you're making a, a payment and you expect a response within minute or so, whatever the timeout is, uh, which is comfortable to you. And if that either of the timeouts are not met, then, well, the request fails. The one other error detection that is really critical to your system is confirm subscriber. If I'm sending a request right now, since because there is no server notion here, so you don't know whether the, service, the server is actually going to process it or not, is a confirm subscriber. So while sending out a request, if you mention that I, it's a switch where you say, I want confirmed subscribers to be true. So the library itself would actually raise an error of 404 in your application code in case none of the services out there were willing to listen to this. Now, 
just going through a sample of how this error would work. Imagine the signal slot example where the signal was sent and the slots expected an error. They would just forward it to an error reporter. The error reporter is a small component which is built into the part of Gilmer itself. I'll explain what that exactly does. Uh, and now th think about the service as well. A uh, request response pattern. In case it's a wrong number, it forwards it to an error reporter. Now, Every error should carry as much information as possible for you and every Gil once you use Gilmer, irrespective of what, what language do you use it in, the error structure would look like this. It carries a topic on which the request was sent, a request data which is uh, pretty well what the request had, user data uh, in case you want anything extra to be sent out, sender, sender is that particular ID which is unique to what uh, to every message, a timestamp. Uh, backtrace is an optional thing which might be uh, available in case, uh, yeah, if there's a traceback available. Although if you use Gilmer, we always give you that. And then there's a code. Now, once this is sent to an error reporter, what can you do with your errors? Now, in a system, uh, these are primarily the patterns that we have seen that you either ignore your errors. Uh, how many of you actually believe in that? Okay, no one. So, or you publish your errors. The publishing of errors or a queuing of error. I mean, this is unique to a system. You could do it either way. Uh, so once this is done, so each of this message, once you start a Gilmer server uh, in your application, you can set the error policy on which error policy is it going to use. If you use publish, we use the same mechanism, which is every message is every error message is sent out to a signal to Gilmer dot error. Now this is where the interesting part comes in. Now, in your application architecture itself, if you're using this, you would have an error receiver which listens, to, which is basically a slot on Gilmer.error and every error that is actually sent out is received by Gilmer.error. And just to show you a demo of how we do this in production, this is, uh, can anyone identify what this is a screenshot of? Do you guys use PagerDuty? Anyone? Okay, yeah, so this is just a uh, screenshot of pager duty. So we have a component which is listening on Gilmer.errors all the time, and any error that comes in is instantly paged out to whosoever is responsible for taking that uh, action on that particular service. Now, monitoring. Monitoring is another really, I would say, an interesting topic in a distributed system, is where traditionally we talk about server monitoring where we have log forwarding and aggregation. Uh, every log that is forwarded, we'd like to mine it later and draw patterns out of it and see if there's an anomaly there. If you use paper trail or log stash or any such thing, logly as well, these services, uh, you can draw grip uh, regex based patterns and then raise tickets out of it. Error reporting, all errors that you have in your server, I mean, these are basic de facto of any uh, server based uh, system that you have. All servers should religiously have this. So I'm not going to touch points on those because pretty much everyone talks about them. Uh, from a service standpoint, what do you care about? As an architect, I care about only are my services running right now? Are my services able of handling capacity? Do my services respond well in time? Uh, this is where Gilmer gives you a component called health bulletin. Uh, this bulletin is written in Ruby. So it's a separate process that you run in your system. So what it does is, so every Gilmer, every server of yours, which is actually registering slots or requests via Gilmer generates an ident for it. It's a UUID and that message is sent out to your, the health bulletin. Now the health bulletin sends a message back every whatever minutes you want to configure it to and it sees whether it's alive or not. Now this is a part that is to replace whether or not, I mean this is the part to actually replace the server part monitoring, whether this particular piece of server is alive or not. This is important from a system administrator point of view. Now if we go one step higher, what do an architect cares? Is my service listening to all the topics? Is my service uh, able to serve well in time right now? And this is what also Health Bulletin does. So you define these are the crucial services in my system. 
So request item dot buy dot four twenty could be one example. Then you say item dot buy dot five hundred, item dot purchase dot anything. These are crucial services that should never go down. Health bulletin will actually look for any active subscribers for that particular topic, and if it's not there, it will raise an error. Now the error is also done through Gilmer dot error. It's the same process. So we eat our own dog food. We use the same pattern everywhere. Uh. Every log message that Gilmer processes is sent out on Gilmer dot log. A Gilmer dot log listener emits messages like this. This is a message from Paper Trail, and if you look at it, that's the uh, the topic that it was listening to. The first one is a host ident. If we really care about what the host was, so it's backend manager zero dot data scale dot io. Then the topic is Gilmer dot health and then every message that is coming out is carrying a unique message id now all messages that you emit in a particular scope of request carry that unique id this is very crucial because now in a distributed logging system you do not know what request came where and what belongs to what the unique identification helps you club all those messages together now uh beyond this uh if you follow unix principle and we believe mostly in uh following the unix philosophies very obediently and one of the policies is that every time you define a service think of service like a unix command line all these command lines can be clubbed together beautifully because they exchange data over plain text uh now you know why you guys hate systemd because it doesn't do that and using composition a command should be able to send data to another command or call other commands in parallel uh or pipe it. Let's take a sample example of what Gilmer allows you to do here. So you can have a service one, which basically pipes the output to service two, which basically pipes the output to another composition. A composition could be any of these things. And 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 service one. I mean, uh, people who are familiar with Bash would actually do this in their sleep as well. This is basic tools for any Bash-based guy. You could have an and and the or or and the parallel being in a uh, really an exception here. So how do we translate that to a software? Let's take a sample example here. This is what a composition would look like. So what I'm doing here is uh, look at the middle line. It's a new pipe. The first pipe is basically it fetches example dot fetch is a topic. The the output of that is sent to example dot words. I'll give you a working demo of this. Basically, a uh, 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 while well, we're talking about distributed system, it would be unfair if we don't have a map reduce problem which does a word count. Now, the pipe output goes to example dot words, where the pipe output goes to example dot count. The pipe is sent to popular. A popular is another composition up there, which is basically running two services in parallel which is find the most popular three letter words and most popular four letter words. All of this working, what you do is you create a new data, a set data, which is a URL of the file, and you just say message batch dot execute. So any of these compositions could be restructured like this. Think of it like Lego blocks here. Now, if I was to alter this and how scalability comes into the picture and flexibility comes into the picture again. Now, if tomorrow I have to change this where I say, I'm gonna add stop filter because the words that are coming out are usually carry A and B, those sort of things. Now I just add a new service here, which is composition example dot stop filter. And in a parallel, I add a new parallel service, which is popular five. So the same code, now I can actually do much more by just probably three lines of code change here. This is another example, which I'll do a demo later. This basically what it does is it fetches the weather data for a particular city for the past one year. Then it groups it up by every month. The next up is it creates a Lambda function, which pulls out the, the weather data for the month of January. And then in parallel, it finds weather.min, weather.max, min and maximum temperature in that particular month for that particular city. It will give you the hour as well for that. Uh, yeah, this is another composition. And if you'll see, is a new parallel, which is actually trying to do it for the month of January and February in parallel. Well, now let's just see a few working demos of this. Uh, it's okay if you cannot read this part because uh, this one is not really that important. This is just a basic demo of an echo server and a client. 
On the left hand side, I'm starting one server, which basically is an echo server. Then I start another one in another team session. On the right hand side, I have a client where I start sending in requests. These are just basically sending a request at every one millisecond. And both the servers handle this in parallel because this is where the locking comes into the picture that both of them won't do it. Uh, I could have more servers on the left hand side, which basically could be uh, 10 or hundreds of them and only one of them would do it. Now, the sample text example that I sh showed earlier, uh, what does a problem statement look like? So I'm going to give a S3 URL, which has a lot of random text, trust me, a lot. And the goal is to eliminate stop words from that file and find the most popular three, four, and five letter words. And the idea is to actually do this in parallel. And the output should be, yeah, with the three letter words, the popular five letter words, and the five le uh, four letter words. So this is a working demo of it. On the left hand side, I have a server again, which basically, uh, this, so this is all done in Go, but you have Ruby examples as well if you go to the GitHub repository. Then I have another one. Now on the right hand side, uh, bottom right hand side, I'm starting a log server, which is basically just a slot receiver for gilmer.log. Now once I'm sending in the first message, basically what it says is it fetches the file. After the file has been fetched, it sends it to a service. One of the service has a word count in it. It groups it. Then it eliminates the stop words. And eventually the output, which is the most popular three letter words in this file were way and four. The four letter words text and copy and then blind and blind. Now let's take a bigger example of weather data that I talked about a little while back. So this is given that you have weather data for of this form. The form is basically a JSON hash uh, of day, month, hour, and degrees. Degrees are in Fahrenheit. Uh, could have been Celsius as well, but I just opted to take it Fahrenheit because it shows a varied degree of uh, temperature difference. Uh, Celsius doesn't do much justice there. Then the goal is for the months of Jan and Feb, I'm going to find maximum and minimum temperature recorded. And if possible, I'll do the tasks in parallel. The output should pretty much look like this this temperature of the dates. And here's a demo of it. I think this should be much more readable. Same thing, left hand side two servers, right hand side there's a log client which is just receiving the log messages. Now it pretty much does the same job here. It com basically sends it on two servers, uh, computes the data and fetches the output which is on the top right hand side. So if I do a quick recap now of what Gilmer does, it's basically a library. It's not an external process. So if you don't have a problem which requires the scale of Kafka, I, this is where it fits in. There is no load balancer needed you don't, uh, because you don't need one. There's no service discovery because we do topic exchanges. There's no HTTP. There's no server endpoint to be remembered. It supports broadcast and wildcard topics. Uh, for the function point scalability, exclusion groups to ensure that a message is only processed once within a group, synchronous request reply pattern, which is the traditional HTTP model, error and health monitoring through an external plugin called Health Bulletin, fairly easy to configure, is available on the GitHub, documentation is there as well, failure detection through timeouts and confirmed subscribers, compositions, this is the real microservices, as we say, where everything should be treated like a function. Now, the good part is that all these microservices, you don't know what language they are written in. You are oblivious to that. One of them could be written in Ruby. The other one could have been in Python. Like the log messages receiver are all in Ruby. There's no message persistence. It's just a transport that you care about. Uh, credits, data scale.io, that's where I work and we use heavily in production. We are a Cassandra hosted and managed Kafka and Spark shop. So all of this is done using Gilmer. I can assure you that all the error reportings, heard, management, everything around it. The repository, you could go to github.com, check out Gilmer Libs. Uh, yeah, that brings a conclusion to my talk here. If you have any questions, I'm open for them. Yes, please. Um, so I had some questions around the composition bit. Yeah, so, please go ahead. Um, I was wondering how, so you can basically design workflows using composition, right? Correct. So 
so i was uh, i wanted to know how you would handle any errors that happens in the middle of something because i cannot do timeouts because uh, in my use case at least i can either run two calculation engines or 100000 and that would take a few days so i i can't really do it and i don't do it using requests i do it using uh, signals so i was wondering how the rollback strategy would be and the error handling strategy would be right uh, so good that you actually brought this up because i forgot to cover it in uh, my talk so the compositions are reusable now if a composition errors out at any point of time whatever is left in the composition can be executed again now it's an interface so a composition has executed to it so whatever so let's say if you had a composition which is add then subtract and then multiply now if it failed at add because you passed in a string or whatever reason whatever is left of it you can re re execute that and or maybe you can pass it to another composition as well and the at what case the error happens is could be well you in your case it cannot be a timeout so you don't let a timeout be there because in that case the job will run infinitely if you can afford that much you let it be that way but in case there was a a 500 internally in one of the services you would be able to reuse that composition very easily and what we are working on next is being able to send composition on the wire so if you use spark uh, you you have you used spark yes. and you have a fire and forget kind of thing so you should be able to do that so in case the caller which is the context right now dies the composition itself pretty much become meaningless so how we are solving this is you should be able to send the composition itself on the wire of course in that case the lambdas will not work because there is no way to serialize or pickle a function and i mean if even if there is it's a it's a challenging problem and no worth going there so it will raise an error that your composition has a lambda here so this cannot be sent over the wire but anything else can actually be json serialized and sent over another service to run and in case it's a really long running job which fails eventually one of them will be able to pick it up and continue from there like all your services that are deployed does that answer your question uh, yeah yeah pretty much right, so good. um just to confirm you can send compositions as json over uh, another so service. when you say composition dot execute you right. would say remote equal to true and gilmer internally will actually send it over the wire by serializing it over uh, json uh, we have a notation for that we're working on it thank you hi uh, uh yeah, yeah i can see you now yeah okay. I have a question regarding the operations of operation side of it. Uh, I was just going to, uh, thinking if you can you come a little closer yeah, to the mic? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, the operation side of it, wouldn't your pub sub service be a single point of failure in this case? Uh, so yeah, I mean it's a fairly interesting point that you have raised here. Uh, we use Redis right now as a backend. If you check out the source code, the backends are swappable. You can pretty much use any backend. But Redis, why? I think it's one of the most resilient and the best transport layers around present out there which and using sentinel you can actually go cross geography as well so the stats are out there on the redis pages on the level of messages that redis can handle and uh, it's really tremendous i'm not saying that this will this is something that actually beats kafka scale and i specifically mentioned that if you have that sort of scale probably you would not use this or you would use this on top of a kafka backend itself because kafka would not support wildcard topics etc stuff like that uh but uh yes fair point i would say weigh your scale and if redis i doubt though that uh redis in a sentinel mode will not be able to handle the sort of load that we're talking what's the sort of load that we're talking about I mean, I'm still other thing. I'm just thinking up front. Oh, okay, all right. So uh, uh, we are we are pretty good for a for a fairly large while. Uh, right. ha have you also uh, looked into RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ or ZeroMQ? Correct. Uh, so the stats say that Redis actually beats uh, RabbitMQ hands down. And interestingly, the project actually started with the RabbitMQ backend, but it wasn't as scalable enough, and hence we moved over to Redis. But uh, we still have it somewhere in the branch, and if you are 